My name is Nickel, O Nickel, and in this video I wanted to show you guys what Overwatch looked like during its development prior to the game's release. So a lot of this information actually came from the most recent BlizzCon, and we actually have some really interesting footage of what different eras of Overwatch's development were actually like for the first time. So as a lot of you guys know, Overwatch actually came after the cancellation of a project Blizzard was working on for a long time called Titan. And so after that project was cancelled, the team was given six weeks to come up with new ideas, so they decided to split Split up that time evenly to work on three ideas one after another. The first idea was a totally different take on the StarCraft universe, not another RTS but within the StarCraft world. And then the second idea was actually an idea by Chris Medson of a cross world that was a planet where lots of beings in the universe would meet and it was meant to be an MMO. During one of the meetings about this game, Jeff Goodman, one of the game developers that would eventually work on Overwatch, said that he wished there could be 50 classes or more instead of just a few. And that led Jeff Kaplan to making an 8-page PowerPoint of a totally different game, which you can see here. And in that PowerPoint, you can see all these different types of characters. You have the Jumper, Reaper, Juggernaut, Phoenix, Architect, Assassin, Guardian, Longshot, Spec Ops, and Mechanic. So some of these things might still be familiar, but some of them are obviously a little bit different. With Jumper, we know that that became Tracer, and so the abilities were Blink and Recall, and the weapons included the Time Bomb and Machine Pistols. For Reaper, his abilities were to have the Shadow Walk and Death Blossom, but his weapons were dual shotguns and a Magnum. Juggernaut even has one of his abilities that says to be determined, but we can see that charge was clearly on the list. The one that's pretty interesting just based on the art here is Phoenix, whose abilities are the Jetpack and Napalm Calldown. Architect became Symmetra, as you can see here, and on this sheet it specifically lists out deploying three sentries, as well as deploying a shield generator. So it's kind of interesting that they had the idea of a shield generator way back on this original slide, and it ended up being something that we got much later on. If you look at the Assassin, the weapons were both the and the katana. So this is probably the point where Genji and Hanzo were still one hero, or at least the concepts of them were still one hero. Even way back then when Mercy was classified as a guardian, she still had a resurrect ability, and also something called salvation. Longshot, even though it looks completely differently, appears to have eventually become Widowmaker, and we can see we have one called Spec Ops that had the abilities for stealth and EMP. And then lastly, the mechanic had a large sentry, a teleporter, and the weapons were a nail gun and a sledgehammer. So Arnold's saying said that after Titan was canceled, he basically just wanted to do anything that wasn't Titan related because he had worked on it for so long. And then, of course, it's devastating to have your project canceled. So when Jeff Kaplan presented this idea, at first it sounded like he wasn't going to be into it. But once he actually heard the concept of instead of classes, you have characters with backstories, he was in. So apparently four or five days to working on the Crossroads idea, they pretty much just shifted gears and started working on this project since a lot of people on the team wanted to see that instead. And this project would eventually have the code name Prometheus. So when they went to go pitch the idea to everyone else, they put together this slide to sell the idea of a hero-based game. And this has even more heroes, stuff that I don't think we've ever seen before. There are tons of different characters, and apparently the only one that was specifically created for Overwatch on this page was Winston. So we even have heroes like this person named Cyblade, who has Super Punch, Shockwave, and Backbreaker. This guy named Firestarter, who has a slag gun, Moltens, and Eruption. Someone named Freak, who's this guy with a mohawk, that has Cannon, Stomp, and Attract. And then some of the ones we saw from before, which were Phoenix, Guardian, then became Angelica, it seems like. Mechanic, then called Ironclad. And that one spider rig character we've seen for such a long time in the concept art is apparently named Recluse. And the first of her abilities we can see there before it cuts off is called Mouth Beam. The image of Genji actually is named Hanzo because they hadn't been split yet. And this character named Iris actually seems to be the Omnic character that we also see in the concept art all the time that we never really had much information about before. And as you guys know, the whole name change between Pharah and Mercy was actually a thing. We can see evidence of that here because the rocket wielder was named Mercy as opposed to what would be her name later on, Pharah. One of the heroes here that I thought was really interesting was actually Hive Mind. So it's this guy here that has this dome over his head and his abilities are Lightning Gun, Disable, and EMP Pulse. Which sounds like it has some aspects to Sombra there, but I just like the way that it looks and the concept of being a Hive Mind. There's a guy named McCloud who wields a sword because his abilities are Claymore, Only One, and Stampede. And there's a guy named Luck who also has a sword, but it's called a Chain Sword and can also spawn minions and has a Flame Strike. And that guy just looks like a really evil hero. The hero that they mention by name in the panel is Mama Hong, whose only ability that we can read there is called Manslaughter. So there's a lot of information here and I'm not going to go through every single one of 
one of these because there's a lot more at the top that we haven't touched on. But maybe in the future, we'll go a little bit more in depth in trying to piece together some of these images with other information that we know. So when they went to go pitch the idea to Activision, apparently this is the image that really sold Activision on wanting to make this game because they liked the way that all the heroes looked. And after that point, the game wasn't greenlit, but it was given permission to get to a green light gate. So this whole time period was actually broken down into a timeline, starting with a tech reboot that went into a core combat phase that they had to have ready by a milestone. So it looks like the tech reboot phase was roughly in May of 2013 up until the pitch, and then they had to create the core combat by March of 2014. It sounds like the two of those phases kind of interplayed a bit, but generally speaking, that appears to be the breakdown. During the tech reboot section, even though Blizzard was working on a new engine for Titan, they still had to create a lot of stuff over again for Overwatch. And the way they quantified this was that over 3 million lines of code from Titan had to be deleted in order to make Overwatch. They only kept about 700,000 lines of code or so. And one of the things that they hear pretty often is that people say that the Overwatch team just took a bunch of the art assets from Titan and put them in Overwatch. But according to this, that wasn't the case. Everything in Overwatch was created from scratch, even if the original concepts or ideas came from Titan. So the footage you're looking at right now is from the tech reboot section of the timeline, and it was the first time they ever rendered anything in the engine. And since they couldn't put guns in Tracer's hands here, she ended up shooting laser beams from her eyes, which is something you guys probably have heard before because it's been mentioned a few times in the past. And basically, you can see her jumping from one platform to another here with her Mickey Mouse gloves on. If you notice in this image, the only thing we really have in the UI is the health on the left side and the ammo on the right side. Interestingly, there's actually some fans at the top of the room that have some effects, leaving a trail behind of where they were spinning. One of the things they were working on here was the environmental lighting. The very first playtest of Overwatch was in November 2013. And the whole point of this playtest was to make sure that the scale, the camera height, and the FOV was all correct, which is the reason why there's just random reaper standing around to give a sense as to what the scale would be. And if you notice here, Tracer actually has her weapons and she's firing from them, but they're just white squares. And at this point, Tracer was the only character in game, even though you do see a Widowmaker running around, it's actually just a Tracer with a Widowmaker skin, which you can tell by her pose. She's leaning forward with her two hands out at the same time. In this one, we can see the physics programmer working on getting the Blizzard physics engine working within the Overwatch engine in order to make things possible like smashing crates and breaking vases, which is something that we're used to seeing today, but obviously had a lot of work go into it in order to make that happen to begin with. One thing that's also worth noting is that the ground has units of measurement on it, kind of like you would expect to see in the practice room. But of course, a lot of these will have that because as they're testing this, they would want to see the distance between certain objects and other characters, even for things like how far can this character really shoot once they're in the game. And this is also one of the first iterations of recall. And some of the things that Jeff Kaplan said that a lot of people don't really think about having to work on were being done during this phase. Even things like when you walk up and down the stairs, how smooth of a ride is it in terms of the hero's head bobbing up and down or remaining pretty stable. So on the left side, you can see the original way it was versus the right side, which is the smoothed out version of it. So the next major section of development after the tech reboot was the core combat section, and they wanted to have it ready by March of 2014. So the plan by then was to have one map, which would eventually become Temple of Anubis, but at the time was known as Cairo, along with four heroes ready to play. So those heroes would be Tracer, Reaper, Widowmaker, and then Reinhardt. And apparently, since Reinhardt was the first melee hero, there was a lot of challenges to make him feel right within the core combat phase of everything. So since Jeff Goodman had a prototype of a hero named Rocket Dude, which eventually became Farah, they tried incorporating that into the game at that point because it felt good to play. So this clip is actually from the core combat phase where Tracer actually has her recall and we can see that we are in an early version of Temple of Anubis. And Reaper was still in there for skills since at the time they were still figuring out how to scale their buildings properly. And the footage that you're looking at right now is the very first day that Farah was actually ever in the game. It was the first play test for her flying around Temple of Anubis. And as you can see here, her weapon was this thing, which appeared to not even be gripped by the hands that were there. It's kind of just floating above it. Some of the things worth noting is that if you look down below, some of the floor tiles actually kind of seem to be spazzing out. And as she's flying around, it's actually a lot slower than we ended up getting in the final version of the game. 
And when she fires her rocket, it's really hard to see because there aren't any visual effects there. And this is Tracer's animation cycle that they were working on. And one of the things they made a note of is the fact that here, her head is bobbing up and down a lot also, which is something they were working on because it was really hard to land headshots with the head moving that much. In January of 2014, they had this version, which as you can see, Tracer is now colored in and is still on Temple of Anubis, but it was still limited to only Tracer versus Tracer. And when she fired, now we can see that it was these long yellow lines. The heights of the building still appear to be evolving, but it's definitely a progression from before. And if you notice in the center of the screen, we actually have this little triangle, the three sides of it that meet. And then on the far left, just the number to represent health. And then on the far right, just the number to represent ammo. But to the left of the ammo, we see a meter for recall. In this segment, they actually didn't touch on it, but it seems like that triangle in the center actually represents Tracer's blinks because every time she would blink forward, one of the walls of the triangle would disappear. Whereas 24 days later, we have something more similar to what we see today, which is the three arrow shaped lines in the center of the screen just below the reticle to represent the number of blinks you have remaining. And in this UI, besides just that, we also have a meter for health and a meter for ammo. But most interestingly, a meter for the ultimate in the center of the screen, which actually says time bomb and has the percentage of all charge. And on this version, they actually have a capture point available. So you can see the A that's on screen actually has a meter below that as well to show the progression of how far along it is to be captured. And at the top of the screen, we see both points A and point B with their own little UIs to represent how far along the progress is. And the way that it seems to me is when you fully captured a point and had an X over it and the relative percentage of capturing the next point would be filled in with red. So here, the point was a little bit over halfway captured, so it was a little bit more than halfway red. Kind of a hard to read system for the points because there's no ticks to tell you how far along you are. You have to just kind of eyeball it, but it was the first time they had this, so it makes sense. So we also get to take a look at what the old health packs look like, and this one is under the bridge that leads to the second point of Temple of Anubis. But beyond that, it's finally not just Tracer versus Tracer. We actually have Reaper in the game now, who's mostly colored in except for his guns. One thing that I don't think very many people noticed was in this section where we see Reaper, we actually have their development chat logs on the screen too, which doesn't have anything life-changing on there, but it's kind of interesting to see how they were talking at this time. We also get to see the old orbs that Reaper used to collect in order to gain health, right before we see what Jeff Kaplan considers the greatest animation for Reaper's Death Blossom. It's basically him just ballet dancing in the center of the screen. In this version, Farrah is also playable and they decided that she would be blue. And in this version, apparently Widowmaker was actually able to use her grappling hook to get up to this section of Temple of Anubis and snipe all the way across the map, which obviously isn't something they chose to keep in the game. In February of 2014, you can see the game looks even more fleshed out, especially the map itself. The map had more textures and lighting effects and and even the UI actually has an image of Farah now in the bottom left corner, along with a visual indicator of the alt charging. Even though this alt charging looks kind of strange, it's like several lines that tick around the center of it. And in this version, Widowmaker's alt apparently would just tag people on top of their heads since they couldn't actually render the silhouettes through the walls yet. So whenever she would use it, it would just show their tag through a wall. So their whole plan for the BlizzCon announcement was to make sure they had three playable maps and 12 playable heroes. So people could decide for themselves if they liked the game or not. So the next thing they showed was early footage for Hanzo. And this is actually playtest footage from May of 2014. First, they just started off by making sure everything with the bow was exactly how it was supposed to be, that it felt right, and then they worked on Sonic Arrow. So in the example, they actually have the Widowmaker hiding behind the wall, and he shoots the Sonic Arrow in order to reveal her. But as I said before, with Widowmaker's ability, at the time they couldn't render silhouettes through walls, so you see the little tag above her head where she would be. And if you look here, Temple of Anubis looks by far the most complete it has up till this point because we actually have all the statues as we have them laid out in the game currently. One thing that's kind of funny to see is that the bow actually has a fuel meter on there that basically just corresponds to how far you draw the bow. And then we can see a bunch of test shots for the scatter arrow. And then eventually we actually have Hanzo's ultimate, which was this centipede looking thing that was just a bunch of brown spheres. I think they actually refer to this as the caterpillar and they even put two googly eyes in front of it. And then eventually they had a dragon replace that, but the dragon wasn't animated or anything here. It just moved forward in space, but there was a little bit of confusion because it didn't have the same hitbox area as the previous brown spheres, so it didn't really make sense until they decided to fill in the rest of the space with a second dragon to have two dragons interlaced with each other that would take up the entire space and fulfill the idea of having a moving AoE attack. So during this time, they're also developing a bunch of new ideas for new heroes. And you can see three of those ideas here. On the left, it's the skinny alien looking thing. In the middle, it's this robotic 
more squat type of character. And then on the right, we actually have a hockey player, which as most of you guys know, eventually became Lucio. So during this process, they tried out a bunch of different variations of animals wearing jetpacks. They would throw down napalm or something else in order to attack everything from alligators, monkeys, a little evil kid. And of course, the most famous example, the jetpack cat. But ultimately they decided that it was a little bit too far beyond the scope of Overwatch to include in this game. So maybe they would save it for another game in the future. One of Torbjorn's early abilities was actually called the claw trap where he would shoot something out of his claw. It would attach to a ceiling or wherever it ends up landing. And then whoever would walk past it would actually be grabbed and pulled back towards them. All right. So step one, throw it out. Step two, deploy. Step three, all terror breaks loose. Because <laughs> of course Torb's gonna throw it in front of straight. And here's early animations on Torbjorn, like it looks pretty ghetto. Um, and then Torb trying to find just that perfect spot, Temple of Anubis choke in the early days. And now watch what happens as our heroes come through. Oh, there's Reinhardt throwing his hammer. Uh, Ryan didn't make it. Maybe Tracer can make it through. Nope. She's not getting through. Maybe Widowmaker, she's clawed and she's done. So you just put the claw in front. Watch, now Reinhardt can think, maybe charge will get me past the claw trap. No. no. Oh, poor Reinhardt. This footage here is of the first Mercy gameplay pretty much ever filmed. And even back then, she has Resurrect as an ability. So this was, I think, literally the first Mercy gameplay that you're ever gonna see. Early Reinhardt with his shield. Yeah. Uh, Mercy got rezzed. You'll notice early on, Mercy's healing was green instead of yellow, and we're kind of mixing the colors, and we really needed to decide, to decide what healing color would be. Would it be yellow or green? And I think we saved green for poison eventually. Yep. Then we actually got a look at the first time Winston was in the game, which is pretty different to how he ended up turning out. This is actually Winston. It might, you might think you're looking at a ferret. This is the first Winston playtest. So his um, leap ability used to be like Doomfist's um, alternate uh, leap ability. And then he didn't have animation, so he just ran around like a dude. <laughs> you see him, just Winston, just running around. Yeah, um, if you notice the targeting thing, the, in, in the, right in the middle, there's like a banana. Yeah, see yeah. the banana right there? <laughs> and one of Winston's early prototypes had him so that when he would leap, he would actually pound the ground and stun whoever was in that radius where he landed. And then Winston's early leap prototype where he used to pound the ground with his fists. They used to do damage and stun you if you were in that range. Yeah, it was a long stun too. It was a lot of damage and a long stun. So that had to go away. One of the crazy things was that Genji actually had a perch ability. So when he was in a state where he always had the blade out all the time, he could actually go up onto a wall, perch, and wait for somebody to come through in order to jump down on them. Fan favorite is Genji. This is early Genji prototype on Gibraltar when he only had the dragon blade and he could perch, like you're seeing him do here, and then run around and murder everybody. So when people thought it was a nerf going from eight seconds to six seconds on the ult, imagine it forever. <laughs> forever dragon blade is what Genji started out as. And so if you were at that BlizzCon in 2014, this is actually what the hero select screen looked like. There was four offense heroes, three defense heroes, two tank heroes and three support heroes. And one thing that's interesting to see is that your actual team composition was much smaller and off to the right. So you can see on the right side, it says playing as Reaper and it has the current team lineup there as opposed to being pretty big across the middle, which is how we have it now. So since this whole archive session essentially ends with them talking about the moment that Chris Medson walked out on the BlizzCon stage and presented the game and what the reaction was to that, the nervous energy that they felt, I want to close out this video by showing you guys a clip from that very first announcement of Overwatch to the world at BlizzCon. Please give a warm welcome to Chris Metzen. What up, BlizzCon? Ah, holy cow. Guys, it is so good. To be back with you all this year, we have shared over the years many adventures together. Exotic worlds, heroes and villains, probably some convoluted plot lines here and there, it's, it's fine. <laughs> and in a moment like this, it strikes me, it has been something like 17 years if my math holds up, since Blizzard opened the door to a new adventure. 
since we opened the door to a new world of heroes and villains, a new universe of adventure and possibility. And if any of you had ever wondered what kind of new world Blizzard would create, well, I think 17 years is too long to wait. And my friends, the wait ends right now. <laughs> Holy cow, this is gonna happen. <laughs> We're gonna remember this moment, guys. I want you all, as I freak out, to relax. <laughs> I want you to open your hearts and your minds to what comes next. You are about to get a glimpse into the future. So my friends, get a load of this. We hope you love it like we do. I'll see you on the other side. Overwatch. It sounds like you guys liked what you saw. Oh, it feels good to share this idea. Holy cow, that's a feeling. I'm sure you all have many questions at this point, not the least of which is, well, Blizzard, is there a video game associated <laughs> with this idea? My friends, I am very, very happy to announce that in fact there is, and it is nearer than you think. <laughs> to tell you a little more about Overwatch, I would like to introduce a good friend of mine Many of you will remember as your first game director on World of Warcraft. He's one of the greatest game developers in the world. He is the game director on Overwatch. Give it up for Mr. Jeff Kaplan. So we wanted to make a game in a genre that we have always been passionate about at Blizzard. So what Overwatch is, it's a team-based multiplayer shooter that is completely action-packed. You guys are going to get to meet our cast of characters. Um, they're absolutely dynamic, over the top. They've got great abilities. But what we're going to do is make the game very approachable and allow, that, allow for everybody to experience what can be fun about this game. You guys know that with, with Blizzard games, what we like to do is find genres that we're in love with and game types that we're in love with and take the best elements of those and really amplify it and bring that out. You saw us do it with the real-time strategy genre, the massively multiplayer online game, and most recently, the collectible card game. But you guys do not want to hear me talk right now. Would you guys like to see Overwatch? Yeah. All right, play the movie. Guys, thank you for being here with us once again. We hope you've enjoyed your first look, first look at Overwatch. We love you. Have fun this weekend. Take care of each other. Have a great BlizzCon! If you guys ended up enjoying this video, definitely leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, as well as checking out some of the links down below in the description, like the ones for Twitter, Instagram, and Discord. But either way, thanks a lot for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.